Boy, I tell you, Easter is uh, coming fast on us, and uh, I need your help. The church needs your help in a couple of ways. Three weeks from today, on Palm Sunday, I'll be preaching to you from the Sea of Galilee. Uh, so I, I just encourage you to be here for that. A little unusual, but I'll be, uh, I'll, I'll be on a boat, I promise you that. Um, I hope. It won't be standing on top of the water for sure. So uh, I'm going to do that. And then Good Friday, we've got our Good Friday services. That Friday night, we're going to have a meal. You can go to valleydale.org slash events, sign up for that meal. Bring your family with you. Bring your neighbor. Bring a work associate. Be here for that. We're going to eat around the tables. And then we'll do what they did in the New Testament. We'll take the Lord's table. We'll observe it after a meal. Uh, which is what they did. So I'll share a little that night. Uh, Kirkwood will have some music for us, but it'll be a great night of just uh, reflecting on the passion of the Lord. Then, of course, Easter Sunday. We need your help in preschool. If you can, we're going to have two services that day. I don't think we're having life groups, but just the two services, 9 and 11. And we're, we're going to have breakfast for you. We're going to have grits, eggs, ham, bacon, well, that's what I'm praying for, so I don't know what they'll have, but that's what I'm asking the Lord for. So we'll have, we'll have a bunch of stuff out there for you to eat, but if you could work one of those services, it would be a real help, uh, especially in the area of the preschool and the children. We're going to need some extra help there, help in the parking lot, help, you know, help uh, at the doors, so just remember all of that. That's coming up in the days to come. Now, take your copy of God's Word. And look with me, if you would, at Exodus chapter 15. Uh, I'm a little tired. This is the eighth time I've preached since Thursday morning. Um, I preached uh, four times on Thursday and two times Friday morning and then uh, twice today. Uh, just finished up a project in Dallas. Um, at least I'm thankful I get to preach in front of people right now instead of a camera. Y'all are a lot easier to preach to than a camera is. So... Um, go with me to Exodus chapter 15, and I just pray I've got the energy to do it one more time here. Exodus 15. Several years ago at uh, University of Texas in Austin, Admiral William H. McRaven gave the graduation speech. He's a 36-year veteran of the Navy SEALs. And uh, to those Texas students, he shared with them uh, about success in life and uh, how the little things make a difference. And in fact, out of that, he wrote, it's an incredible little book. I read it not long after I heard uh, his commencement address. It's called 10 Lessons to Change the World. And in it, I want you to listen to what he says. He talks about the little things that you do in life that make such a difference and how you cannot skip those little things. He says this, Every day during training, you were challenged with multiple physical events, long runs, long swims, obstacle courses, hours of calisthenics. Now listen, hours of calisthenics. And he says, uh, something designed to test your mettle. Every event had standards, times you had to meet. If you failed to meet those standards, your name was posted on a list and at the end of the day, those on the list were invited to a circus. Uh, a circus was two hours of additional calisthenics designed to wear you down, to break your spirit, to force you to quit. No one wanted a circus. A circus meant that you didn't measure up. A circus meant more fatigue, and more fatigue meant the following day would be more difficult and more circuses were likely. But at the same time, in SEAL training, everyone made the circus list. Uh, but an interesting thing happened to those who were constantly on the list. Over time, those students who did extra hours of calisthenics got stronger and stronger. The pain of the circus built an inner strength and it built a physical resiliency. Now, if you didn't catch what all he's saying, he's saying this. He's saying that there is no quick way to becoming a Navy SEAL. 
He says it takes hours and hours and hours of dedicated training and then hours of dedicated training after that. There is no silver bullet. There is no way you become a Navy SEAL painlessly or instantly. And as I read that and thought about the Christian life, the same thing is true with the Christian life. Uh, There is no way to spiritual maturity instantly or painlessly. I'm sorry to disappoint you, but there's not. There's no spiritual gift that makes you spiritually mature overnight. Uh, You are in a process, if you've trusted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, you're in a process that's called the process of sanctification. Now, your justification, that is your salvation, was instantaneously. That moment that a person begins to pray and ask God uh, for repentance, as he repents and asks God for forgiveness, the moment he starts that, even before he can even get to, Lord, I trust you, Lord, be Lord of my life, before he can even get there, the Lord is already in the process having saved that person. Justification is instantaneously sanctification You're going to be in that process until the day God calls you home. There is no quick way to spiritual maturity, and that's exactly what you're going to see in the life of these Hebrews. If you've got your Bibles open there to uh, Exodus chapter 15. Now, we left them standing on the banks of the Red Sea. And they're there in a worship service. They're there in a celebration service. They are singing praise songs. They're singing contemporary praise songs. Well, it was contemporary. It's the first time they'd ever sung it. Uh, You know, at some point, Bach was uh, contemporary. (laughs) It was the new thing uh, when he first wrote it. So there they are. First time they're singing this praise song, and they're giving all this worship to God and all this celebration to God. God had delivered them, delivered them out of Egypt, delivered them out of bondage, uh, delivered them from 400 years of just pure drudgery. And now God brought them, and he took them across the the Red Sea. He opened the sea for them. They saw that miracle. You remember the cloud gave light for them on that side. They walked through that sea, walled up on either side of them, and God delivered them, brought them up to the banks of the Red Sea on the other side, then closed the sea on the Egyptian army as it attempted to cross the same path. They saw God deliver them from their enemies. And I I shared with you before that God so effectively dealt with them that they would not be bothered with the Egyptians for the next 500 years. So God did something miraculous. God did something that was pretty incredible there. And what they don't realize now as they begin to leave the banks of the Red Sea is that God is going to lead them into the wilderness before he ever leads them into the promised land. And God is going to, let me me just cut to the chase and tell you the bottom line. God is going to take them through a process in order to show them what is in their hearts so that he can prepare them to go into the promised land. Do you know what God's doing with you? God is preparing you not to go into a geographical location, but to move into heaven itself. Now, that's, where, that's why he's taking you through what you're going through. That's why you're experiencing things that you're experiencing, just like these Hebrews that God was preparing them to enter the promised land. He is preparing us to enter into his eternal heaven. Now, let me tell you what it takes. What it takes is this. It, It takes a sanctification in your life where God wants to see if you can praise, if you can sing in the days of triumph, can you also sing in the day of trouble? Now to the text. Uh, Verse 22 of chapter 15, God's going to move us in the sanctification process. He's going to move us from the triumph to the trouble. And you say to God, does God really do that? Does God take us? Well, just listen to the text. Moses led Israel from the Red Sea and they went into the wilderness of Shur. And they went three days in the wilderness and found no water. And when they came to Marah, they couldn't drink the waters of Marah for, the, uh, for they were bitter. Therefore, it was named Marah. So the people grumbled at Moses saying, what are we going to drink? 
And then he, that's Moses, cried out to the Lord. Now let me just stop right there and let's catch up to that point. Uh, If you look at the text, you're reading this and and it's unbelievable that in three days they move from singing a, a song of celebration and praise to the point of just absolute panic and worry. Three days. That's what the text says. Three days, one moment they're praising God, the next moment they are what? Grumbling. When the, when the praise and the worship stops, the grumbling usually begins. Whew, amen. It's like us. We're in here. We're singing praise. We're giving God celebration. We're thanking God. And at the moment we get out into the foyer, we begin to grumble about some things. Now, that's okay when we talk about the Hebrews, but don't talk about us like that, Pastor. Well, I am. <laughs> so that's just the way it is. We're just like that. I had a man come up uh, after the last service, and he said, are we just like the Hebrews? And I said, just like the Hebrews. We move, listen, let me tell you, you get whiplash watching these Hebrews go from a moment of trusting God to go to a moment of doubting whether they can depend on God whatsoever. Now, you read in verse 22 that Moses led Israel from the Red Sea. Now, that's not really the case. He's the physical leader. He's the man that's in front, but it's God who's leading. Don't forget the cloud is leading all of the people of God. He's leading these Hebrews. We've not talked much about the cloud. I'm going to get to that at some point, but I want you to know it's the cloud that is leading them. That is God who led them to a place that is called Mara, a place that is so incredibly bitter. And it always happens after victory. It always happens. It happens in my life. It happens in your life. I watch it happen in the life of the church. I see it time and time again. I've seen it in other people's lives. I've seen it in my own life personally. I've seen it in the life of the church. I want you to understand something. I want you to listen to me carefully. You never experience a spiritual victory that goes uncontested by Satan. He never lets you get by with it uncontested. You go through periods in your life where God has given you great spiritual victory and you're growing and you see God moving. We had a great service last Sunday. We saw how God has blessed us financially. We see how God has blessed us numerically. We're seeing all of these missionaries and how God has just really blessed our mission endeavor and the mission work of this church and the prayers of people in years gone by and God's blessing it now. And it was a great day of victory. I want to tell you something. I am not foolish enough to think that Satan is not actively looking right now to contest what we experienced then. And he always does it by coming in and looking and saying, did you really get serious about God last week? Were you really interested in doing God's will last week? Are you really serious about trusting him more and walking with him more and giving more of your finances so that the gospel can go around? Are you really serious? He comes. He confronts you in the moments of your commitment. You have a spiritual victory, but let me tell you something, trouble's coming. You just might as well count on it. You say, well, that's not very attractive to people in here who need to come to Jesus Christ. I'm giving you the truth. Follow Christ, you're going to have trouble. We often think, well, let's just tell everybody that it is often, you know, angel dust and, uh, you know, streets of gold and it's all wonderful. Let me tell you, to follow Christ takes people who know what it is to be dedicated, committed. Now, that's what he's trying to show them here. He leads them to this place, and this place is going to be this place of, it's it's a place of trouble. They're thirsty, and all that is there is this brackish water. Now, let me show you the second thing. Let me get you to the second thing. And the second thing is this. I want you to understand that he's going to lead you now from trouble to testing. And let me just show you this, if you would, right here at the end of verse 25. There he made for them a statute and a regulation, and there he tested them. You see that? He's going to test them in this place. Uh, because he wants to know. 
what's in their heart. In fact, that's what he's going to tell us over in Deuteronomy chapter 8. Now I'll get you there in just a moment. But when they come to Marah, they could not drink. Now they see this water, they've been thirsty, and so they see the water and they rush to it and they grab just a, they cut their hands, grab a handful of water, bring it to their mouth, and they spit it out. They spit it out because it's bitter, it's salty, it's brackish, it's briny. They spit it out and they can't believe what's happening. And so in verse 24, we're told, so the people grumbled at Moses. Now, naturally, they're not going to do it against God, but that ultimately, that's who it's against. But they're grumbling at Moses. By the way, you know what the Hebrew word for grumble is? Loon. Loon. So when you grumble, you're just a loon. That's Hebrew. That's English <laughs> as well. You grumble, you're just being a loon. They grumbled at Moses, saying, what are we going to drink? What has happened here? Now, you would think to yourself, I just saw a sea open. I just walked through the sea on dry ground on the riverbed, on the seabed. I came up the other side. I saw God close the sea on top of my enemy. I would think that miracle would do it for me for life. Would it for you? God, if you'll just show me that, that's all, you know, that's all I need. Just do one something like that. Doesn't even have to be the river. Part this creek right here. Let me just see what that, just do it right here and let me see it. And we think, well, if I see something like that, I'll forever be changed. It will do something. I want to tell you something. Miracles seldom ever change us. And you say, well, I, I don't believe that. Well, good, because I'm going to show it to you in Scripture. I want you to take your Bibles, put your finger in Exodus 15, and go with me to Mark chapter 6. Jesus had just fed the multitude. I love it when, to read about Jesus feeding people because there's always food left over. There's always something left over. He feeds 5,000 people, 5,000 men. That doesn't count the women and the children. He takes those five loaves of bread and those two little fish, and he breaks it up enough to feed probably 15,000 people or more, 20,000 people or more. Mom, dad, two kids, there you go. He feeds them, and there are 12 baskets full left over. And so Jesus does that, and Jesus looks at the disciples, and he says, now, guys, I, I've got to get away for a little bit. Uh, I'm going to go and pray. You get in the boat. You go to the other side. I'll meet you to the other side. They get in the boat. They shove off. It's evening, and they are headed to the other side, and a storm blows up on the Sea of Galilee, an incredibly wicked storm that uh, is constantly blowing them back. They might gain a yard or two, and then they're blown back five or ten yards. The, the, the sea is pushing against them. The waves are billowing up over the boat. You know, water's getting into the boat. They panic. They just know that they're going to drown. Jesus sees them. He comes walking to them on water. And what does fear do? Fear be breeds fear. Panic breeds panic. Here they are, they're in a panic, they're in this state of fear, and Jesus comes walking to them on water, and they see him, and they think that must be a ghost, and they go to screaming. They go to screaming, and Jesus spoke to them and said, really, guys? That's, what, that's the Greek there in, in the text. He said, take courage, it is I, don't be afraid. And he got in the boat with them, and the wind stopped, and they were utterly astonished. It's like they can't believe this happened for they had gained no insight from the incident of the loaves. None. None of that ever dawned on them. None of that ever crossed their mind. They never thought we just saw Jesus feed thousands upon thousands of people with just so little a bit of food that surely we can trust him riding in a boat in the midst of a storm. They never thought that. In fact, Christ wasn't even on their mind as they see him walking out there to him. It must be just something else to panic over, something else to worry over. And he gets into the boat and they are just astounded that this has happened because they gained no insight. That whole concept of no insight means to be dull of understanding. 
How do we get dull of understanding? We get dull of understanding because we refuse to be sensitive to the things of God. We refuse it. Now, these Hebrews learned absolutely nothing at the Red Sea. I'm back now to Exodus chapter 15. They learned absolutely nothing. What was God trying to teach them there? Just as simple as it can be, trust me. Just trust me. All you got to do is trust me. And there they saw that they could trust him. But now, at these bitter waters, they begin to grumble. Do you know what's happened here? It's a pattern in their lives. A pattern has set up. Who you are is what you practice all the time. A lot of us practice a pattern of just falling apart. A lot of us practice a pattern of just going to the dark side with everything. A lot of us pack, practice a pattern of just complaining about everything that there is to complain about. And when there's nothing to complain about, we'll dream up something to complain about. Amen. A lot of us just practice grumbling. And so it becomes this pattern. It gets ingrained. It becomes this default position that happens, that takes place in our lives. I want you to look at something. Just put your, again, again, put your finger there in Exodus 15. Look over to Deuteronomy chapter 8 and listen to the Lord. Now listen, this generation that, that we're talking about in Exodus 15 is going to die in the wilderness. They never get out. Those in Exodus 15, they never get out because they keep practicing this pattern of not trusting God. It, when you come to Deuteronomy, you've got their children now. This is a whole new generation. And so Moses now is speaking to this new generation, and he's saying to them this, you shall remember all the way which the Lord your God has led you in the wilderness these 40 years, that he might humble you. You ever thought that what you're going through is God attempting to humble your life? And you say, but uh, pastor, my life doesn't need to be humbled. There it is right there. To humble you, testing you, to, to know what was in your heart. Now, let me, let me just tell you something. God doesn't need to know what's in your heart. You need to know what's in your heart. I need to know what's in my heart. Do I really trust the Lord? Am I really confident in God's uh, help? Am I really confident that God will come through? To know what was in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. Now, look down at verse 5. Listen to this. Thus, you are to know in your heart that the Lord your God was disciplining you. A lot of us are going through that. A lot of us are going through troubles because God's wanting us to see our own hearts. A lot of us are going through troubles right now because God is trying to discipline us, to grow us, to teach us. And we're going to get to that in just a second. That pattern become so deep-seated in our lives that we can't seem to break from it. And so we go from trouble now into the testing of God. God says, what, what's really in your heart? Mary Graham uh, was a lady who was, a wonderful lady, who used to be over the Women of Faith conferences. They were held all over the country and um, Everywhere they went, they were always sold out. They always had huge, just crowds. They couldn't get all of the women in one place. They would sell out auditoriums. They would sell out arenas. They would sell out, you know, ballrooms in places like the Hilton or the Marriott. They would have these huge ballrooms. They would always sell out. She told the story of being sold out one night. They were having this great speaker and a wonderful evening of dinner and uh, every chair was taken, and there were women that had come in that bought tickets that were standing around the wall of that arena where they were, standing around the walls of that ballroom. And uh, the women had come in, they bought the tickets, and they thought, well, there's no room. There are no more tables. These walls are open as far as they can. They can't get another table in here. We don't know what they're... And they began to get hot. And listen, atmospheric-wise, it was hot because of so many people crammed into this room. 
And so now they begin to get hot, upset, talking about, well, where's my chair? Where's my table? Um, we bought a ticket. Surely you did not oversell this thing. Surely you knew how many people you could get in here. Uh, surely you would have cut this off before you sold me a ticket and you didn't have room for me. Well, Mary Graham was just beside herself. She went back, she got the, a hold of the manager of the venue where they were, and he said, listen, this is the only thing we can do is this, is we can take the chairs out that are there and bring in smaller chairs. And uh, so that was all they could do in order to fit all of these people around these tables. And so he, she has to go back out and stand all of the ladies up that are sitting down. Now you've got all these ladies hot. Uh, those that are around the wall are already upset. Now you're beginning to upset these ladies that had already gotten there and gotten a seat. Well, we were here first. We got here. We got our seat. We got here in a timely fashion. They changed the seats and they put in now these smaller chairs. And as they put the smaller chairs in, they call the ladies from around the room and they get in and they're all at their tables. Well, we can't eat like this. We can't enjoy a meal like this. We can't fellowship like this. This is impossible, sitting in these little tiny chairs that are hard and difficult and you can't expect us to go through this. Well, Mary Graham was just at her wit's end. She didn't know what to do. So she was going to go back and just cancel the whole, the whole thing. Just give everybody their money back, cancel it for the night. She goes back to the speaker. She looks at the speaker and she says, I'm just so sorry. I don't know how we could have done this. But the women are so upset about the seats that they're in uh, that I don't know what we can do. And you probably don't want to go out and speak to them. And so in tears, she's standing there and she says that to the speaker and the speaker says, no, 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 let me go out. Let me go out and talk to the ladies. So Joni Erickson Tata wheels herself out and looks at the women and says, I understand you don't like the chairs that you're in. <laughs> and Joni Erickson Tata says, I don't like the chair I'm in either. And I've got a thousand handicapped, crippled friends that would change chairs with you in a second. Testing comes in the Christian life. How do we respond to the testing? Now let me show you one last thing. The last thing is this. You move from testing to teaching. You know, it's out of the testing that God is trying to teach you something. And God comes and look at what he does. Pick it up now in verse 25. Moses cried out to the Lord. He's the only one turning to the Lord in this. And the Lord showed him a tree. Now the word showed right there is the word that means also to instruct. In other words, he shows this to Moses with a word of instruction. I'd love to have that word of instruction, but we don't have it. Uh, but the Lord shows him this tree and tells him something. And we do know that he told him to throw it in the waters. And he did, and the waters became sweet. And then the Lord says this. While they're there, verse 26, he said, If you will give earnest heed. Do you see those two words? Earnest and heed. Same word. In the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the Hebrew Old Testament, it's, it's, one word, it's the same word used twice. Uh, in the first case, it's an infinitive, a koe. It comes from akuo, akuo, acoustics, a koe. That's the infinitive, and akousais is the imperfect tense. So he's using these two words in two different tenses, an infinitive and an imperfect. And I can only tell you what that means. It intensifies it, but I have to show you what he's doing. He's saying this, listen, listen. You ever said that to your teenager? Listen, listen. That's what is being said. Give earnest heat. Listen, listen to the voice of the Lord your God. Do what is right in his sight and give ear to his commandments. Keep all of his statutes and I will put none of the diseases on you, which I have on the Egyptians for I, now notice that, watch this, a new name of God appears right here in the text. It has not appeared in scripture before. It is the first time that it is used. Jehovah Rophe. The God that heals thee. 
Do you hear what he's saying here? Do you catch what the Lord is saying? He comes to Moses and he says, Moses, pick up that tree, cast it into the bitterness. And that bitterness became sweet. And he says, I am the God. You need to understand, I'm the God that healed that water. I'm the God that can heal you. And in Jesus Christ, who came and he saw a tree and he threw himself down on the tree and the tree by God was picked up and thrown into the bitterness of our sin and out of the bitterness of our sin because he was thrown in it comes the sweetness of his salvation. And God says, I'm still Jehovah Rapha. I'm the God that heals you from all of your sin. And what does God do in his goodness and his mercy and his grace after the people are grumbling and complaining, which has become their default, which has become a pattern? What does God do with them? Does he yank them up and spank them? No, but that's what you want. What does he do? What does he do? He takes them seven miles. That's interesting, seven miles. The perfect distance he takes them. And he takes them down a perfect distance to a place called Elim. Elim. And there at Elim or Eliam, there are 12 water pits that are very deep and very big. I've been there. I've seen it. I asked to get out so I could go and count them and look at them and stare over into them and see what I could see. I took my boys out of the car, took Courtney. I said, let's come out here, get out here and look at this. Took Barry out there. You remember that, Barry? All the things I've done for you. I took him out there, showed you those deep water pits out there and 70 date palm trees, one whale for every tribe, One date palm for every elder, 70 elders, 12 tribes. God takes them down there. And there they come to fresh, clean, non-brackish, not salty at all. They still drink the water that comes out of those water pits. Today, they do. He said, well, where'd that water? Just seven miles up the road. It's brackish. It's terrible. It's bitter. It comes out of Africa. Out of Ethiopia, there's a mountain there called Ras Deshan that's 15,000 feet tall. Mount Kenya in Kenya, 17,000 feet tall. Tanzania, Mount Kilimanjaro, 19,000 feet tall. All three of these snow-capped all year long. And on the top of these mountains, that snow melts all year long. They stay snow-capped. There's no end of the supply. All of that snow up there begins to melt, and it goes down through thousands and thousands of feet of rock, purifying it. Cold, purified water. And all the Hebrews come there now, and they drink. And they rest under the palm trees. That's what God does for them. That's what God does for us in his mercy and his grace and his goodness. You see what happened there? What happened there was this. Is that while they were complaining, underneath their feet, God was sending their supply. Underneath your feet. You don't know where it's coming from or how it's going to get there. But I'm telling you, child of God, God is Jehovah Rophe, the God that'll heal you. Just stop your grumbling. Put your trust in him. He's got an unseen resource that is making its way to you. Here endeth the lesson. Let's stand. Oh, the goodness of God. In the midst of my upset and grumbling and complaining, God has his answer on the way. 
What a good God. What a merciful God. What an infinitely patient God. Aren't you thankful for that? If you're here this morning, you've never put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, let me tell you, he went to a cross for you so that he could take away all that sin and that guilt and that failure and that sense of failure in your life. And he brings to you the sweetness of God's salvation. Boy, why not trust him today? Why not give your life to him today? Why not stand up and step out and say, I'm coming today and I'm putting my faith in Jesus Christ? What about all the rest of us? Because we are just like those Hebrews. We move from moments of worship and then we just go out of gear and by the end of lunch, we're already falling apart. God never intended you to live life that way. God never intended you to live life constantly. Moaning and groaning about the troubles. What he, what he does intend is for us to learn the lesson of how to sing, not only in triumph, but to sing of the mercies of the Lord forever, even in our trials and testings. How about you? How does that come down in your life? Where does that find you this Sunday morning? I'm going to invite you to come and just get on your knees here at the altar. If you want to join this church, I'm standing right here. All you've got to do is walk to me and say, Pastor, I want to, we want to join your church. I want to join your church. Others of you, you say, what do I need to do about giving my life to Christ? Just come to me. Just tell me, I want to give my life to Christ. I just pray, Father, that in this moment, we would honor what you are calling us to do. And I pray that in Jesus' name. You come right now. Heads are bowed. Christians are praying. You come step out and come and make that decision.